Please, please, I don't know how many times I have to reiterate this. We have 500 people here. We have 100 reviews on Amazon. That means 400 of you haven't reviewed it. I, I don't know what I have to do to get you to take a second out of your life and go on Amazon and review the book. This is a book that is going to be an evangelistic tool. For instance, I just got word this morning, somebody here gave the book and to somebody. Their mother was on their deathbed. They read it to their mother, and their mother repented of their sins and accepted Yeshua. I got a, I got a letter from a heroin addict that accepted Yeshua. It, it really, God didn't have me write it for no reason for this last day. Um, also, do we have any Spanish-speaking people here? Raise your hands. Don't be ashamed. You're legal. Raise your hands. Okay. The book is going to be translated right now as we speak into Spanish. It's not translated by just anybody. It's translated by, you know, a professional publishing translator, okay? We're spending the money. I just wanted to make sure. I need you to figure out what websites, what pe I just don't want you to hand it out to a couple of Spanish people. There's hundreds of millions of people that speak Spanish, and they don't speak English, right? I need you to get it in the hands, so I need you to figure it out because I'm not a marketer. I don't know how to market. I never did. And then whatever it takes, whatever it costs, if you need free books, I don't, this is not at all about money. Also, I need you to pray about something, okay? They, this one for Israel, I, didn't, I don't know them, um, but I understand they're incredibly powerful. And they have the only messianic um, college in the world and I got a call from the head of it, this guy, Erez. I don't know him, but I'm going to meet with him when I'm in Israel. He asked for the book. Now, if he, you know, hopefully God will move on his heart because it's, it's not his book, it's not his ministry. If he translated into Hebrew, he can get into the hands of hundreds of thousands of Jews in Israel. So you understand what this is all about, right? Um, I just leaned into Bernard and I go, I hope, you know, it's, you know, he has a ministry, right? I'll give him the book. I'll give him the book. I'll make a huge donation to his ministry. I don't care about money. I care about souls. Souls are priceless. That's all I care about. That's all I ever cared about. This is like a big interlude. I didn't want to be a, a pastor, a rabbi. I had no delusion to be that. Some people really want to do that. I absolutely didn't want to do that. I thought it would take away from what I really want to do, which is see souls saved. That's it. I'm very one-dimensional, very boring, you know. Um, I never paid attention to when people prophesied over me. I mean, some of you like to hear a word over you. I had thousands of people prophesy me. I never paid attention to it. Why didn't I? Well, what if they were wrong and then I walked in it? And if they were right, wouldn't it come to pass anyway? So my, my mode of belief was, Father, tell me what to do. Um, also, pray about a trip. Yesterday, I don't know. Got up, started to read the Bible, heard from God, and booked a trip. It's a crazy trip. I'm going to be going to Ethiopia and check on that ministry. Then I'm flying to Kenya to check on that ministry. Then I'm flying to India to check on that ministry. Then I'm flying to... Australia to check on that ministry, and then I'm going to fly to, to uh, Tokyo because I want to do some witnessing there. Um, so if, if you're not excited about anything, get excited about this and, and, and help me along with prayer. Uh, you know, pound on heaven's door. And, and let's see as many as we could see come to faith in these last days. Okay. Well, this is the culmination of the full feast. It has a beautiful trajectory, you know, regathering, repentance, and reinstatement and rejoicing. It's just, it's just absolutely beautiful in 15 days, you know. And, and there's a reason. There's a reason why there's five days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. There's a reason why there's 10 days between... Ten is a significant number. Five is a significant number. Ten is a number for completion. Five is a number for grace. It's absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. So I'm not going to belabor. I don't have that many screens. I don't have that many scriptures. I don't think it's necessary. This isn't a dissertation on the feast. or It's just a message.
for today. So let's just look at the first two verses in this chapter we call Leviticus 23, the chapter on the feast, 44 verses on the feast. This is what it says. It says, Adonai said to Moshe, so this was not Moshe's idea. This was not the Jewish people's idea. It's not my idea, your idea. It's the Lord's. Tell the people of Israel, these are his people. These were his children. Um, I heard a, somebody recently, a very famous man of God, say that we're all children of God. This guy is like a big shot in the Christian world. And he's, his theology is pretty solid. But he's wrong. We are not all children of God. We're all made in God's image, but not all of us can call him daddy. So that was so, see how it's just something like that? And then you get a non-believer and go, cool. I'm a child of God. Don't judge. And they go to hell based on what he said. Just a little, one sentence. I don't know. I said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, my, my people, my children, the designated times, or the Moadim in Hebrew, of Adonai, not of the Jewish people, of the Lord, which you ought to proclaim, Moses, when you finish talking with me, go out there and tell them what I just told you. They're holy, meaning they're onto him. He's the only one that's truly holy. We're holy by association, not by nature. They're holy convocations. We're to convocate. They are my, and why did I put that in red? Because I wanted them to pop. I wanted it. They're my. The operative word at the beginning of this chapter is that little word, my. Very, very, very important. I want you to consider remembering that these feasts are the Lord's feasts. They belong to him and they are on to him. From him and through him and back to him are the feasts. God gave them to the Jewish people, right? It's a fact. But why can't they be celebrated by believers in general? I mean, it's kind of weird, right? I mean, Bernadette biologically is half Jewish. Her mother's Jewish. Her father was not. Growing up, she was raised Catholic. We get married. Should I take my sons and go burn? These are Jewish feasts. I'm Jewish, so I'm going to have my son celebrate the feasts. You take Shana and Lily and you do Christmas and Easter. That's a divided house. God would never... A house divided must fall. The Lord says it might. He doesn't say it might fall. There might be issues. He said it will absolutely come tumbling down. So that doesn't make sense in my family. Why would it make sense in the body of Messiah? It's spiritually illogical. And it's not really biblical. So I don't say, hey, you know, go, go tell your pastor he should. Listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. Most pastors know these are the Lord's feasts. Most pastors know how Saturday got changed to Sunday. But for them to change, they'll lose three-quarters of their congregation. Too much is at stake. No offense. I'm not worried about losing you. I'm worried about losing him. Here's the thing, though. Here's the rub. Here's the thing that I want you to, you know, I try to get you on a fast track because these are things I've contemplated for over 30 years. And you could be new. You could be here, coming here three months. So you're on a fast track, man. This is, this is the rub. If a Christian sees the feasts as purely Jewish feasts, if they see them as Jewish feasts, which, listen, I hear it all over the news, all over the radio. Even the Jewish people say, oh, they're, they're Jew, you know, the Jewish festivals, the Jewish feasts. It's not true, according to Leviticus 23. But if, if... That Christian sees him as purely Jewish feasts, and he and, or she is convinced that Christianity has nothing to do with Judaism, which most are, then he or she will have nothing to do with the feasts. It's that simple. Christianity is different from Judaism. These are Jewish feasts. They belong in Judaism, so they have nothing to do with me. That's a fact. The Bible contains, I'm not trying to impress you, but 1,189 chapters. And truth be told, there is no chapter like Leviticus 23. None. It's crazy, right? 
Leviticus chapter 23 gives us the blueprint for God's plan of redemption, and the whole Bible points to redemption. It's all about redemption. They seem to be hidden at first glance, right? Like, you know, you could have been going to church and reading the Bible forever, and nobody ever brought it up. It was like, well, just that's, first of all, it's Old Testament. Secondarily, it's Jewish feasts. Just leave it alone. Just, there's nothing to glean from it. But now that you're in a Messianic community, and now that we have the New Testament in written form, cat's out of the bag. It's really quite blatant and quite obvious. There are a total of seven feasts, three in the spring. You, it's, it's, very, it's really not, it's so not complicated. Don't complicate it. Don't read those books that are 3,000 pages on the Feast of the Lord that somebody who had nothing better to do with their life wrote. Don't do that to yourself. Why do you want to know what the Talmud says? Why do you want to know what the Kabbalah says? Why do you want to know what the rabbis of old said? Why do you want to know what a PhD said? Why not just go to the Bible? I got news for you. You want me to shake the lulav, Layla, right? The Bible doesn't say to shake the lulav. I'll shake it for you if it makes you happy. Three feasts in the spring. Pesach, I know some of you won't say Passover. It's America, Passover. First fruits. Pentecost to Shavuot. Shavuot means feast of weeks because it's seven weeks plus a day. Penti from the Greek, 50, 50 days. It's real simple. All the spring feasts point to Yeshua's first advent, his first appearance, if you will. He dies on Passover. He's buried on Hagmatzor. He rises on first fruits, and then he sends the power to do what the Father is commanding us to do because, frankly, without the power, we can't do it. Not, it's not doable. And you know what the cool thing about that is? Let me explain to you why that's so cool. If you could do it without the power, then if you did it without the power, you would get the glory. Since you absolutely need the power, he has to get the glory. And God will be very, he'll let you get away with a lot of stuff. Like sin, he won't let you get away with per se, but he'll let you go, oh, that was pretty stupid. Or, well, the Lord, thus saith the Lord. He's like, no, I didn't. But when you touch the glory, that's where you're going to have a spiritual fight on your hand. And you're going to lose that fight every time. Every time. Now the fall feasts. Again, very simple. Feast of trumpets. Jewish people call it Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. Day of Atonement, Sukkot. Real simple. Simple. People come into the movement, they go to me, Rabbi, I've got so much to learn. I'm like, no, you don't. And they're like, well, you're just saying that because you know so much. I don't know so much. You know what I know? I know you don't have to know so much. Real, real, real simple. They all point to Yeshua's return or his second coming. Now, this is, I don't want to be sarcastic, but I do speak three languages. I speak Hebrew, English, and sarcasm. Since God has fulfilled Messiah's first arrival on the spring feast, and since he does everything special on his feast days, I would just make that, I don't want to assume, but that he's probably going to fulfill his second coming on the fall feast. The Bible declares that Yeshua will appear again with a teruah, literally a teruah. The word is blast, but it's teruah in the Hebrew, a teruah from God's shofar. There's a pretty strong chance that that teruah is going to take place on Yom Teruah. The Bible then says they, the Jewish people, will look upon him. It's prophesied in Zechariah 12.10. And mourn like one mourns for an only son. This is a reference to the Day of Atonement. A Day of Atonement for the Jewish people. A Day of Atonement. Why? Because Passover is for the individual. Atonement, Yom Kippur, is for the whole nation. It says the whole nation is going to recognize him as Messiah. It fits in perfectly, seamlessly, unequivocally, irrefutably. It's perfect. Lastly, the Bible says that the Messiah will begin his glorious reign and tabernacle among us for a thousand years. This points to Sukkot. It points to the Feast of Tabernacles. Here's a question. Why do I celebrate the feast? Why wouldn't I? I'm Jewish. Oh, hold the phone. 
You're Jewish? Yes. You're black, right? You're Hispanic, right? I mean, that's, you could walk around and say you identify as a non-Hispanic. There's a lot of people identifying as all kinds of things these days, right? But yeah, I'm, I, I didn't stop being Jewish. Uh, hold on. Time. That doesn't work in the Christian world. Wait just a minute, Rabbi. Wait just a minute. How could you believe in Jesus as the Messiah and still claim you're Jewish? Well, truth be told, I'm in pretty good company. There were 12 called the disciples. They believed in Jesus. They remained Jewish. I don't see any conversion for them in the book of Acts. Do you, are you reading a different book? At Which Acts are you reading? And then there were 120 born again on Shavuot. They were Jews. How do you know they were Jews? Because pagans don't come all the way to Jerusalem to celebrate Shavuot in the first century. That's why. <laughs> so they remained Jewish, and they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Next, there were 3,000 Jews in Acts chapter 2, still there from Shavuot. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and they remained Jewish, then the book of Acts tells us there was tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, who were zealous for the Torah, meaning they believed in Jesus and remained Jewish. I'm just highlighting stuff that everybody else lowlighted. It's obvious. In fact, truth be told, the very first non-Jewish or Gentile, if you will, that just means non-Jewish. It's not, it's not derogatory. It's not derogatory. I know you think it is. Just like you think when you say those Jews, that's derogatory. Call them Jewish people. It's not derogatory. Gentile, goyim, just means of the nations. It means non-biologically Jewish. It's not second class. It's just a fact. The first non-biological Jew who came to the faith was a man by the name of Cornelius, and that was in 40 A.D., which means for seven years, everybody that got saved, hundreds of thousands, million, purely Jewish. That's why Peter had to see the dream, because he thought it was going to be a purely Jewish movement. He was shocked. With that being said, I have a very funny feeling that this man that was steeped in paganism gave up his pagan feasts and probably started celebrating the Lord's. I can't say for sure, but it would have been pretty weird if he would have said, what are you doing? Oh, we're celebrating Sukkot. What's that, Pete? Uh, you know, when the Lord tabernacled first, and he's going to tabernacle again, and prophesies about and how God protected us and we're supposed to be thankful. Oh, okay, well, I'm going to cut myself and throw my kids to the fire. How could they, how could they worship together? That was what Acts 15 was all about. We have to have table fellowship. The things you're doing are too weird for us. Like, you're having sex with everybody that walks. Like, we can't do that, man. We're monogamous. So that's not going to work. So that's got to stop for us to get together, and then we'll share, and we'll get you up to speed. That's how it went down, man. That's how it went down. This is what's key about Sukkot. Look at just one verse. It says, you are to live in booths for seven days. Some people take that that they should camp. Some people take it that they should live in the sukkah. It, it doesn't really mean that. It's to spend time in the sukkah. Every citizen of Israel is to live in a booth. It doesn't mean 24-7. It doesn't. If you want to, it's okay. It's okay. I could tell you that camping with the Coleman stove and the heater or the RV is a lot different than being in the wilderness. In the wilderness, they had no food. You know, your tent is full of food, okay? They didn't have Lay's potato chips in the wilderness. Just saying. So give it a rest. We're better than everybody else. We're in the wilderness. Look at all the food we have in the wilderness. And we have alcohol. Woo! So if we run out of food, we're just going to be wasted so we won't even know it. Look at the word. It's the operative word for Sukkot. Booth. Sukkah, sukkah, okay? Temporary shelter, very important. It was a tent, that's what it was known 
3,000 years ago, a temporary shelter. What is that telling us? I think it's telling us something loud and clear. I think the main directive on Sukkot is to live in booths because a temporary shelter provides a much needed, let me say that again, a much needed, Americans, corrective, corrective to the natural pull or tendency of becoming excessively attached to stuff. People love their stuff. When you go to people's house, they go, let me show you all my stuff. I hate stuff. Ask my wife, hate stuff. I throw her stuff in the closet. I just have to remember, take it out of the closet or you'll pay with your life. All her stupid doilies, the stupid things she buys that mean nothing, that just get in the way. Yes, it goes in the closet. You don't need four pillows, psycho. You have one head. Stuff. Just stuff, accumulating stuff. I love living in a studio. You can't have any stuff. When I had an apartment, I had nothing. I had a, we first met, I had a bed and a chest of drawers. I didn't even use three of the drawers. When I went to get a, a went to roadside China in Yonkers and I had to buy, what do you call that? Plates and stuff, what do you call it? What's the fancy word? Dinnerware. And she goes, the lady goes, well, how many, how many, for how many people? I go, one. <laughs> I was serious. She goes, well, they don't make it for one. I go, why? It's just me. She goes, aren't you going to have anybody over? I said, no. <laughs> not, not to eat. No. So she said, well, the minimum is four. I was like, I got to break three plates. <laughs> hate stuff. That's why I don't buy stuff. Never, ever. I hate it. It's an albatross. You got to take care of stuff. You got to maintain stuff. You got to look after stuff. This morning I realized I never liked my house. I could walk away from any house. You know, people are like, oh, it's sentimental. No, not to me. It's nothing to me. A car. I name my car. You're an idiot. It's a car. <laughs> this morning I was saying to the Lord, I said, I love my house. I never said that. He goes, I know you do. Why do you love it now? I said, because all the kids are gone. <laughs> they messed up the house. Why? Because they're stuff. And then you got to maintain that stuff more than any stuff. We are pulled today like never before. Constantly throwing things at you. You need this stuff. This stuff will make you happy. The stuff you have isn't big enough. Seventy inch screen? What do you think? You are Amstar? Are you selling tickets? There are so many things that are vying for our attention. And even for you holy rollers, you're still caught up with stuff. I've been to your house. One important takeaway from dwelling in temporary shelters is for us to focus more on the eternal and less on the temporal. Yeshua has to be our foundation. And we need to build our lives on him. Look at Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4. This is from the Lord. He's speaking to us today. Don't put your trust in princes or in mortals who cannot help. He's telling us why. They, they're not, they can't be there for you. They can't. There's times, a lot of times, burn can't be there for me. Yesterday I was so weary, I was overwhelmed, and I came home, and I said to Bernadette, that I go, I'm so weary, and she goes, the whole world is weary, get off it. <laughs> wow, did you just finish, 
Did you just finish reading Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People? She just finished cleaning the house. So? What do you want from me? Enough! (laughs) When they breathe their last, they return to the dust. Listen, this is so simple and profound, guys. Let's just enjoy today. Stop being uptight. On that very day, poof, my dad had the worst job in the world, the major loading dock of the U.S. Postal Service. He just loaded trucks, and he had to get there at like 3 in the morning, and it was awful, sucky work, took three trains, and he finally figured out how he could maybe retire early so he can go to a Yankee game. He could go downtown and watch the ticker tape for the stock market, although he can never afford to buy a stock, listen to Judy Garland, and love my mom. That's what he wanted to do. So he clicked his heels and he said, kid, I beat the freaking system. I'm retiring early. And three weeks later, I watched them carry my dad out in a black bag. All the plans died with him. It is not long before some of you young guns are going to figure out you can't trust in man. Not even in princes who are supposed to be superior. We come to the realization that the best of men are men at best. Some men mean well. But the bottom line is no man can save themselves, let alone others. When a man's heart stops beating... He dies, and his body returns to the dust, and all his grandiose plans die with him. Sadly enough, and it's said, we might say of man that he is unreliable, impotent, mortal, and fleeting. Look at the next verse, 146.5. It's good news, though. God doesn't just say, can't trust man. They're unreliable. They die with their plans. Done. He goes, no, you can be happy. Happy is he. Unhappy is he in the last two verses, but happy is he whose help is Jacob's God. Why why, why did he say Jacob's God? He didn't have to say that. He could have just said, right, happy is he whose help is God. And everybody would have been happy with that, right? I'm good with that. Why Jacob's God? Because Jacob represents the undeserving. He was a trickster, a conniver, a total player, a manipulator. If anybody didn't deserve the Lord's mercy and grace, it was Jacob. And he gets to be a patriarch? When we say we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, he's thrown in there? Guys, we are the undeserving. And the next verse tells us why God is so worthy of our confidence. Verse 6. He made heaven and earth. You're not just talking about some powerful guy or some rich guy or some guy that has some influence. Hey, I'll make a phone call. I'll get that ticket taken care of. I knew those guys. I knew those guys in the Bronx. The Bronx is a total shady thing. Everybody's on the take. Everybody knows somebody. Everybody's got a guy. You want something? I got a guy. And I had this cop friend. He was, uh, forget it, but... He gave me a badge. He gave me a sergeant's badge, and I wanted to check it out. I wanted to check it out, see if it works. So I sped through this town called Bronxville, which is a real uppity town. I went through a red light and a stop sign. A guy pulls me over. He gets out of the car. He's got his hand on his gun. I said, I'm sorry, officer. Um, Will this do anything for me? He said, have a good day. Even when you know people, I knew a lot of people, I can get into Studio 54, still, God made heaven and earth. You're not talking about somebody with a little power or somebody who can get you in a club. You're talking about almighty God, dude. Where's your priorities? Huh? What are you going to do? Keep working your tail off till you can't see straight and keep buying crap till at the end of your life you go, Wow. Was this what I did all this for? Just for this crap? I'm not even happy. He made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. How's this? You'll never keep faith forever. 
not on your best day. He's the omnipotent creator. His power is unlimited. What can he do? I'll tell you what he can't do. He can't go back on his word. That's what he can't do. Therefore, I'm here to proclaim to you there is absolutely no risk involved in trusting him. For he is the dependable one. Forget about somebody else letting you down. You let you down. Now, you know I always tell you some words have roots, some don't. So I always check if there's a root. A lot of times there isn't. There's a root for sukkah. Look at it. Soak. Soak. And it's hiding place. The, it, the roots give you a deeper meaning. Look at this. This is crazy. Look at Psalm 32.7. It says, you are a hiding place for me. You are my sukkah. You will keep me from distress. This gets good. It gets good. Hang in there. Hang in there. You will surround me with songs of deliverance. With intense gratitude, the psalmist acknowledges God as his hiding place. I know some of you have like 20,000 rounds. You've got one trigger finger. <laughs> click, 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 click. He's proclaiming that God is his protection from trouble. This is a major part of the Sukkot message. The message on Sukkot is that God is our provider. God is our protector. That's why they live in booths. Because in the wilderness, there was no stores. There was no food. There was no water. We have everything. We have a medicine cabinet. It, it looks like Walgreens, some of your medicine cabinets. God is our provider, our protector, our fortress. And the message on Sukkot is those who live in close fellowship with him. Listen, there is nothing wrong with the Wi-Fi. There's something wrong with the connection. God is always transmitting. Some of your receivers need a little work. This is crazy about this word. This is a rarity. This is only a few words in the whole Hebrew language have a third root. Look at the third root. Sochach. Don't even try it. Please. Look at the definition of this. This is, this, to me, I'm sorry. I get excited. You know what I mean? But let me tell you what I'm, what I'm sorry about. Your lack of excitement. To shelter to hedge, to fence about it. Are you seeing these words? To stop the approach of, I made sure I got every last definition out of it. And this is my favorite to lay over. Let me explain. Look at Psalm 5, 11 through 12. And that's the end of our verses. Let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them forever shout for joy. Shelter them, and they will be glad, those who love your name. Not just anybody. Not just anybody. It doesn't work like that. For you, Adonai, bless the righteous. Not just anybody. You surround them with favor like a shield. Go, go back to that definition, please, to shelter to shelter. God's going to cover you. To hedge and fence it out. He's going to put a protective fence. But how's this? It gets deeper. To stop the approach of. So he's going to stand outside the fence and stand between you and the enemy. First century sheepfolds in Israel had one door. Do you know where the shepherd slept? In the doorway. In the doorway. In other words, God's saying, you want to get to, listen, we've been in situations, not bragging, no more, I'm 65, I can't find anymore, I just can't, sorry. But I, I, will, I will find a way to hurt you. I have bit, I've done whatever I had to do. But back in the day, if there was an altercation, because we went to places where there was altercation, I always put Myrn behind me. 
and basically said, if you want to get to her, There you go. You know what this, go back to the psalm for a minute. This, guys, this is gorgeous. I want you to get as much as you can. I'm sorry. I meditate on this all day long, so I'm, I'm, I always get downloaded about this stuff. I understand. We're at different places and different things are going on, but try to get this. While God is dealing with his enemies in judgment, his friends always have reason to shout for joy. For they find him to be their refuge, strong, and sure. May all who love the Lord magnify his name as their unfailing defender. No question about it, God does favor the righteous. He will surround him with grace like a protective shield. Put up that Sukkot screen for a minute because I want them to take their eyes off the. Sukkot is really all about being thankful. You know, I narrow down all the feasts to one word. Passover's, you know, deliverance and trumpets is regathering. Sukkot is just thankfulness. That's why it comes in the fall. And if you read history, you'll find out that the Puritans, or even before the Puritans, the separatists, they left the Church of England because they wanted to worship the Feast of the Lord. And they came here. It wasn't called Thanksgiving. Our president called it Thanksgiving. Why do you think they had a dish called Sukkot Tash, which nobody knows the origin? What do you mean you don't know the origin? It's Sukkot Tash. <laughs> God dwelt with his people in the wilderness. It was about his presence. And he kept a watchful eye on them as he does today. So we thank him for his provision, for his protection, and most of all for his presence. We forget so easily. Too, too easily. In gratitude, is, is a sickness of the soul. It's not a physical sickness that many, all of us in here have probably some physical thing going on. But we don't think about how sick the soul can get. And gratitude is a soul sickness that infects many of us. It spreads a lot faster than COVID. It is a disease that attacks the eyes making us see only what is missing in our lives and making us blind to what we do have. It is a disease that attacks the heart, hardening our arteries with jealousy. It's a disease that attacks the soul, filling it with bitterness, resentment, and envy. Gratitude is the key to happiness and the key to good mental health. We live in a society today where people have a sense of entitlement. When a person feels a sense of entitlement, their faculty for appreciation ends up being crippled. It ends up being very difficult to feel any sense of gratitude when you feel entitled. An advertisement recently asked me, Quote, don't you deserve a new Lexus? I don't, I don't even think I deserve a car. Recently when I go away with Bernadette because we have a little time now, people say, you deserve it, Rabbi. No, I don't. I mean, thank you, but no, I don't. Why do I deserve it? I don't think I deserve a Lexus. I'm glad I have a car. We never had a car when we were young. I used to go to this beach called Orchard Beach. You won't know about it, but look on the internet what they really called it. It's pretty derogatory. It was part of the sound that was dirty, filthy. Stuff was floating in it. It was my Hawaii. 
I was a kid from the projects. That was my Hawaii. I had to walk two and a half miles to the bus, wait online. A lot of times I didn't get on the first bus because so many people in the Bronx are trying to get on buses as a little kid. And then I'd get off that bus and get on another bus and finally get to this disgusting, horrifically smelling beach. But when I got there, I was so thankful and so happy. I won't forget Orchard Beach, even when I go to these pristine beaches. Fortunately for all of us, there is a vaccine against this soul sickness. In Hebrew, it's called chaharet hatov, which translates into English as recognizing the good. So in Jewish circles, this is the prayer we say, baruch hatod anoy oheinu hagomel lahavayim tovot shigmalani kol tov. And the translation is, blessed are you, O Lord, who bestows goodness on those who are undeserving, who has given me all good things. Sometimes the hardest arithmetic to master is that which enables us to count our blessings. Guys, we need to come to the realization that we are in fact in the last days. And sadly enough, some of you are in the last days and you don't even know it. There's conditions underlying that are going to take some of us out and there's nothing you could do about it. These fall feasts are going to be fulfilled soon enough. God is once again all over the world. Just he's struggling to do it in America because we know too much. And we don't like to say we're wrong, so we hold on to what we were taught. We don't like to tweak anything. God is once again breaking down the middle wall of partition between Jews and Gentiles, like he did 2,000 years ago. Satan is in a state of absolute panic as he has done all he could these last 2,000 years to rebuild that wall. Why is he working so hard at rebuilding the wall? Well, first of all, his modus operandi is to divide and conquer. But more importantly, he knows that the more Jewish people who say Baruch, Habab, Hashem, Renoi, in regards to Yeshua being their Messiah, the closer we are to the second coming. And to be perfectly frank, he knows that Yeshua's second coming translates into his second going. The first time Satan went was when he got kicked out of the highest of heavens for attempting to usurp God's authority. Now the line of Judah is getting ready to roar like never before. This time, Satan will not only get kicked out of the heavenlies, but he will be sent to the pit where he must remain in chains for 1,000 years until he is cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. In these last days, God is doing something magnificent that I am privileged to see every day. He's removing the scales off the eyes of the Jewish people so they can recognize Yeshua as their Messiah. He's restoring the Jewishness of the gospel so that they can be restored. You know, there was a reason why Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him. They were brothers for a long time, a very long time. How did they not recognize him? Because he took on an Egyptian culture. He took on an Egyptian garb. He was shaved with short hair, with snake bracelets, so they didn't recognize him. That's what we did to Jesus. Constantine took him and de Judaized him. So the Jewish people are like, no, nah, he's not us. But just like Joseph said, Ani Yosef, I am your brother, and I'm here to save you. Yeshua is going to come back soon and say to his people, Ani Yeshua, I'm your brother, and I've come to save you. More Jews have come to faith in this last generation than the entire first century. 
and the revival has just begun. By the same token, God is removing the scales off Christian eyes as well. Christians around the world are coming to the realization that they were in fact grafted into the commonwealth of Israel and that the faith was, is, and always will be Judeo-Christian. We have to remember, especially at Beth Yeshua, you know, this is what Bernadette and I worked 21 years for. We worked for community. That's what we wanted from day one. We wanted to create a legitimate community. We have a legitimate community. We had 600 people sign up just in a matter of a few days. We had to cut it off. You guys have to remember being part of this community that Jesus has but one bride. She is neither Jewish nor Gentile. She is neither male nor female. She is neither black nor white, Hispanic nor Asian, Baptist or Methodist. She is blood-bought and spirit-filled. So as I've stated in the past many times, but there's some new people here, is Judaism the problem? And the answer is no. Biblical Judaism basically is the Ten Commandments, and the book of Romans tells us that the law is holy, just, and good. So then, then is Judaism the answer? No, the law can't save you. It can only point out that you need a Savior. So what is the problem, Rabbi, and what is the answer? Sin is the problem, and Yeshua is the answer. On an individual level, sin produces guilt, pain, family upheavals, disease, and finally death. On a national and international scale, sin produces poverty, revolutions, war, famine, disease, epidemics, and disasters. Thank God, thank God that he sent his one and only begotten son to tabernacle among us 2,000 years ago. And thank God that he's coming back soon to tabernacle us forever. A lot of you guys, you're going to camp this week, I presume, right? Get your camp on, have your little party. I want you to try to not forget three things. And this is how we'll end. One, don't forget the reason for the season. Sukkot brings with it a very elaborate ceremony. They bring water from the pools of Siloam. There's celebration for six days. On the seventh day, there's a crescendo. It's the Hosanna Rabbah, the great outpouring. They're praying for winter rains. It's the end of the harvest. No winter rains. No spring harvest. No spring harvest. But they're praying for another kind of rain. They're praying for Messiah's reign, R-E-I-G-N. And it's Messiah himself that stands on Sukkot on the last day. And he says, hey, guys, John 7, you're praying for the Messiah to come. Over here. Over here, he's come. And he says, come on to me. He doesn't say come on to church, not that church is bad. He doesn't say come on to the communion table, not the communion table is bad. He doesn't say come on to the waters of baptism, not that that's bad. He doesn't say come on to fellowship, not that that's bad. The only thing that will do is coming on to him. Today I will baptize four people. One young girl came up to me last week. I love when this happens, crying. I want to be saved. No invitation. The Holy Spirit. But today I'm inviting you. If you have never legitimately done it, I don't care. You could be 85 and been in church for 65 years. It doesn't make you a believer. You can't go to God and say, I've tithed. I went to church. I took communion. doesn't mean anything. Unless you drink from him, and to drink from him means you say, all these things I've done to hurt you and to hurt everybody else, I am so sorry. I want to take your sacrifice, your blood literally, and I want you to wash me clean of all of it. Then I'd like you to empower me so I could try to walk this out. And then when I mess up, and chances are I will, I promise I'll fess up quick and get back in the race. You don't have to make a major thing. Come up to me afterwards. 
Okay, we're going to go across the street. There's a public pool. You don't have a bathing suit, I get you a bathing suit. You don't have another outfit, I get you an outfit. You're supposed to meet somebody for lunch, I get you a sandwich. Don't miss the opportunity. Don't miss the opportunity. You might think, are you pushing, are you playing guilt games? I don't play freaking guilt games. Who do you think this is? Guilt games. But let me tell you something. Your life is not your own. I go up every six months and I find out am I going to live or not live. That's how I have to live my life. That's how you got to live yours, pal. Here today, gone tomorrow. Don't forget the reason for the season. Number two, don't forget just how blessed you are. Those who participate in the first resurrection are blessed. Why? Because they won't be included in the second death. When all non-believers, sadly enough, sadly enough, read the book. There's a buttload of apologetics. There's a buttload of brilliant scientists who are devout believers. Don't believe the scientific community that said there wasn't. Tons. Blaise Pascal, Sir Isaac Newton, geniuses, the authors of science, devout believers, seminarians. We have the proof now. Cat's out of the bag. You can't stop being ignorant and saying man wrote the Bible. God wrote the Bible through man. Better to die once and be born twice than to be born once and die twice. And if this wasn't enough, all believers shall be priests of God and Messiah and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Whoa. Whoa. And last but not least, number three, don't forget the best is yet to come. After the thousand years are up, the Bible tells us that the new heavens and the new earth shall be ushered in. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning. No crying. No pain. We get to say farewell to every sickness and disease. Some of you say, well, Rabbi, I'm 50 years old. I'm still not on a medication. You will be. We say so long to the sterile world of surgery, anesthesia, intensive care, intravenous feedings, hypodermic injections, chemotherapy, dialysis, and the unending pill parade. Depression is history along with every other mental illness. There is no need for hospitals, drug rehabs, funeral homes, or suicide hotline. And Kleenex will have to file chapter 11. <laughs> it's all new. It's all restored. Finally, we can say, it's all good. Let's stand together. Tried to get you out in time so you can go home and drink before the party. Before that pre -game. <laughs> Again, I don't drink because I don't like the taste. The Bible nowhere says you can't drink. It just says beer is a brawl or wine is a mock. You know what that means? Drink responsibly. I worked in bars all the time. I've never seen a drunk do anything good. If you really, no, not even dance. That's, that's the thing they do the worst, actually. But, but. The, but the whiskey muscle is funny because they actually think because they watch somebody do MMA, they know how to do it when they're drunk. And then the next day when they wake up in the hospital and <laughs> it's always a bad move, you know, then all of a sudden, look, if you really need to get drunk to have a good time, then something's wrong. Something foundationally is wrong. So, you know, just think about it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yeshua. <laughs>
ונפונו ולך, ואשם לך. שלום, חג שמח, I love you.